Somebody said, anyone got an idea of what we should do as a stage set? Geezer said, Stonehenge. And the guy said, well, how do you envisage this? And he said, life size. <laughs> and brand new member, Ian Gillen. Hello. Good to have you all here in the studio tonight. Look at this album sleeve. Look at this magnificent album sleeve. I made one record and did one tour and it was lasted about a year and it was the longest party I've ever been to. We just we got together and started writing and it was uh, it was it was good. We had a bloody laugh, I tell you, we had, if nothing else we had <laughs> we had a laugh. Bev stood in really quick actually when Bill had to leave mm -hmm. due to illness again. Before we knew it, it was number four in the British charts, and we heard a copy of it, and it, the sound was well, dreadful. Fingers crossed for a remix one day. I think it would do well if it was. Then came the real problem, because I couldn't get into my brain any of these lyrics. I couldn't understand them. So I, I made a cue book, and I practiced in my kitchen before I went away, turning the pages over with my foot. And I realize now that I'm standing shoulder high in dry ice, staring at an audience that's just witnessed what it's seen. And he had his hair down like this, going like this, and he goes, shh. <laughs> trying to see the lyrics. <laughs> Gillen had risen to fame in one of Black Sabbath's 1970s rivals, Deep Purple, the voice behind such classic rock staples as Smoke on the Water and Highway Star. He would leave that band in June of 1973 and release a number of solo albums and projects. I'm still very proud of the music we made, but if I look at the albums that we made, I can see a formula to a certain extent. The first track on an album would always be a fast rock and roll number. And then it would go through, I mean, I was very pleased with the music, it was good, and I was not in any way ashamed of it, but uh, I felt there was a time to add a new dimension to it. Meanwhile, Black Sabbath blazed its trail to success, first with the voice of Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy's, um, he's in a great tradition of British musical lunatics, I think this trend started probably by screaming Lord Satch, mm. and uh, I think he's wonderful, he's very but, consistent. Will he ever be surpassed, do you think? Who, Ozzy? Yeah. Um, I hope so, but um, I can't see it happening. But it would be great if somebody else came along, even more lunatic than him. Yeah, yeah. It'd be wonderful. I mean, uh, he's. I remember his frustration once he came to the dressing room, and uh, we were doing a show with Gillen and Mike Sabbath, quite a lot of bands in Frankfurt. And uh, Ozzy came in, weeping on my shoulder, said, "I wish I could do what you did." And he said, "What's that?" I said, "What's that?" And he said, "Leave. Have the guts to leave." Black Sabbath. He said, I've got this nightmare, I'm going to be singing Paranoid when I'm about 90. And if, I, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have said, well, don't worry, I'll do it for you. I said. After years of turmoil and drug use, the band was forced to find a new voice for its next chapter. Rainbow's Ronnie James Dio would give the band a renewed sense of energy, but it wasn't long before the ranks of Black Sabbath would be victim to turmoil again. In Sabbath, the lineup of Tony and Geezer with Ronnie Dio and Vinnie Apice lasted for two albums before trouble arose. The problem centered around mixing a live album. The engineer who was uh, doing the product um, was drinking a lot. And he would tell Tony and Geezer that Vinnie and I were going into the studio and turning up the drums and the vocals. We were going the next day and go, what the hell is that into the guitar and bass? And then you know, Ronnie changed it all, he brought all the vocals up more. And <laughs> I couldn't understand why they would listen to an, to an idiot who was drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels every day. You know, it made no sense to me. So, it came next that we banned Ronnie from his studio. We wouldn't let him come in, you see, and that's, of course, that's when it all, that's when that, that was the final straw. It just, it just broke up. Ronnie and Vinnie left Sabbath. And just when things looked brighter than ever for the group, fans were hit with another change. Dio left Black Sabbath to be replaced by original Deep Purple lead singer Ian Gillen. Each time the frontman was lost and regained, Sabbath's legions of fans swung around in step. For many bands, changing lead singers could mean a loss of their signature and identity. I asked Ian Gillen what he thought it was about Sabbath that could allow them to go on despite those switches. The basic thing that I noticed as soon as I met 
Lisa and Tony was there. The fact that they still had a lot of hunger. And I think the identity, um, or the image of Sabbath hasn't changed that much, even though um, they went from Ozzy to Ronnie. I mean, it's the, the power of the band, the identity, the, the image was still there. There was sort of that little, uh, I don't know, incestual thing between Deep Purple and, and, and Sabbath. I don't think it was meant to yeah, be know, that way, it was, was it? very peculiar how all that happened. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it turned it out every time we <laughs> changed the member, some, somewhere along the line, it'd been with Deep Purple. So it's like, oh, or it went it. to Deep Purple yeah, or something like that. Right, yeah. yeah, or something off, offshoot, like with Ronnie and uh, Rainbow and stuff. But you had like. Ian Gillen. Ian Gillen, we had Glenn Hughes. Ian yeah, yeah, still is. He's a great friend and I still speak to him a lot. Um, I think he's a real good, good vocalist. It, 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 it's certainly identifiable. His voices. I'm a blind man. I'm a blind man. Now my room is cold. When a blind man cries. lost touch with Sabbath's career um, over the last few years, working with my own band, and they hadn't done so much work in Europe and the Far East where I was mainly concentrated. And um, I, mean, I thought they were tax exiles laying on a beach somewhere. At this time, Black Sabbath was being managed by the notorious Don Arden. The next choice for a singer would actually come from him. In time, I just decided to scrap the name Sabbath and just form a, a, a band, <laughs> not Black Sabbath. So, um, and we were mismanaged by Don Arden at the time, so uh, he suggested getting Ian Gillen into the band. And, uh, Ian Gillen, how the bloody hell is that going to sound like? I got a phone call from Tony Iommi saying, uh, you fancy drink? You two guys, us, Tony and Giza, you, you contacted him, did you? Well, it was all a, it's arranged via the office and via your office. Mm. And we met in a, a pub in Oxfordshire. Oxford. It's one of those sort of meetings that we went halfway. So I went out for a drink at the Bear in Woodstock with Tony and Giza, and uh, we met at lunchtime. And I can't remember much after that. We had a few <laughs> drinks, and we were apparently uh, we went in for lunch, and uh, at, then in the evening they wanted to open for dinner, and we had to be I don't know who drove me home or whatever. I think we got there about lunchtime or whatever it was. And, uh, of course, the chat went on to five, six, seven, four, you know, we are all legless, absolutely rotten. Geezer Butler and I were under the table, as far as I remember. I got a phone call from Phil Banfield, my manager, the next day, saying, Ian, if you're going to make <clears throat> these major decisions, career decisions, he said, I think we should talk about it first. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, apparently yesterday you agreed to join Black Sabbath. I said, well, I don't remember that. And so anyway, we came out of there and we, we got a band together. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> very peculiar thing. Yeah. And uh, Ian didn't even know either. Did that happen? Did, what, what happened? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think we arranged to, to have a play together. Oh. And that's what happened. That's how silly it was. I mean, that's yeah. how, they, how we started. The next thing we were doing, we were into uh, rehearsal, writing an album. So that's how it came about. And that, that, how, that band really was put together on paper. We'd never rehearsed. It was only like, it seemed a good idea at the time. Jeff Nichols would retain his position on the keyboards. The next step for Black Sabbath was the recruitment of a drummer. Original drummer Bill Ward, who had left during the Heaven and Hell tour, had seemingly beaten his battle with substance abuse. Yeah, I had a heavy drinking problem. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I had a heavy drinking problem, which I've now uh, managed to arrest. Hey, well done. So, uh, yeah, and I feel pretty good about it. That's you know. cool. You look really well. Yeah, I feel pretty good. Yes. <laughs> so terrific. Yes. So, um, you know, that, <clears throat> that's, that was uh, a lot of the problem, to say the least. Yeah, a hell of a lot. Did you do any playing whilst you were off sick? Um... Not really. Uh, I, I tried. I had several efforts to try and different things. All most of them, well, all of them unsuccessful. You know, 
Uh, everything that I, uh, everything that I touch turns. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you contact uh, Tony and Gita with reference um, to joining the? Well, I'm back or all day. We're still in touch, touch with them. We, we, we're still in touch oh, yeah. all the way through. We've never, yeah. we've never. Uh, We've never, we might have drifted apart a little bit, we've never drifted, uh, you know, we've never sort of gone, you know, I'll sod you and all that bit, you know, I mean, um, I've always been, you know, thinking about the guys and stuff, you know, I was, they're, they're always there all the time, every day, you know. At that time he'd started trying to get himself together and he was, um, he'd gone to AA and he was in detox and we called him and said, come and, you know, do the drumming on this new album and Bill said, I don't know whether I can handle it, you know. I've got to stay in detox until I'm well enough. So I said, oh, come on, you'll be all right. I had just enough energy to go to England and go to Oxford and uh, record at the Manor Studios the album Born Again. That was the very first album ever in my life that I played clean and sober. And I think the identity, um, or the image of Sabbath hasn't changed that much, even though... Um, they went from Ozzy to Ronnie. I mean, it's the, the power of the band, the identity, the, the image was still there. And I certainly um, think that that continuity um, has been perhaps the key to people staying loyal. And I think certainly with rock bands anyway, they tend to be a lot less fickle than perhaps supporters of other kinds of music. So you've got to do something really awful to, uh, to actually get rid of your fans, you know. Once the media learned of this new formation, they were understandably curious. They had a big press reception when they, they got together and Ian already looked a bit uncomfortable and unsure of himself even before he'd actually sung with the band. So <laughs> it was a bit debatable whether he really was committed to Black Sabbath. Um, Ian w wouldn't wear leather like the other guys so he went and got a blanket um, and cut a hole in it and put it over his head and that was his outfit some people were surprised but uh, when you think about it it really does make a lot of sense in that uh, you obviously share the same background as ian well that's right yeah i mean we were we were both uh, from the same stable and um i went in with purple and us with sabbath and we were, we were both neck and neck really so it's, <laughs> it's great being able to team up there i was the worst singer black sabbath ever had it was totally incompatible with any music they'd ever done. I didn't wear leathers, I wasn't of that image. I loved Tony, loved Geezer, but by God, we had a good year. I, I think the fans probably were in total state of confusion. The newly formed Sabbath, dubbed Deep Sabbath by some, settled into Richard Branson's picturesque manor house in a quaint Oxfordshire village to make the album. But of course, Black Sabbath don't do quaint. Well, there were quite a few things that happened during that time, including the night racing, um, the canal trips, the explosions, lots of explosions. We had a good um, pyrotechnics guy, Handy, who was, <laughs> I don't know how he ever got licensed, but um, it was pretty incredible. So we wrote some songs, and um, we, we went to record at the, the manor, uh, the Richard Branson's place and I'd never been there Ian had, 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 had worked with Branson, known Branson through uh, yeah. his past dealings. Virgin tycoon Richard Branson would also occasionally turn up to check on his house guests. Ian and Richard got on very well and I think Richard probably had a few glasses of wine with Ian and they went out to play. <laughs> Running around the manor throwing uh, snooker balls at the windows breaking them and I'm standing there thinking you own this place. Ian said to me before we went, he said, of course, I'm not staying in the house. I went, what do you mean? Because we all live there. You know? Yeah. He said, I'm not st I won't be in the house. He said, I shall have a, a marquee outside. Oh, God. I said, you serious? He said, yeah, I'm going to have a marquee outside. OK. <laughs> Thinking he's having me at it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> sure enough, I'm driving up to the manor. I saw this marquee outside. I He's serious. <laughs> My, it was mostly a camping session for me. It was for you, yeah. absolutely. And uh, poor old Bill found some fish in his wardrobe, didn't he, one day? <laughs> uh, the, the camping thing Ian's on about, it was, um, <clears throat> it was Ian's idea to, uh, to sleep outside in the, um, at the manor. And he had his, all, all his camping stuff up and uh, 
you had a marquee up there, set yeah. up outside, didn't you, with all your cooking stuff and yeah. everything. And Cooked me breakfast. He'd done everything outside. It was his, uh, his healthy... Yeah. Uh, Until I got blown up. <laughs> <laughs> it was a health kit. Yeah, it was just my <laughs> nature boy, wasn't it? I said, well, well, why is this? Why are you, you know... Yeah. He said, oh, my voice, I like to be, you know, out in the, in the open air. Oh, OK. All right. That was his excuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we won't go any further than that. No. And, um, so we did. Well, you guys were up all night. You were up at the nightclubs or goodness knows where. And I used to see you coming back in the morning. When I used to get up and cook That's right. breakfast. That's right. You guys would just be arriving back from Birmingham. Yeah. Or, or wherever you'd been. Yeah. And you'd go to bed. As I went in the studio and we'd wave at each other as That's we were right. passing. Yeah. And I'd have a listen to what you'd recorded the day before and That's sit down and make up the words and the tune to it. And uh, then I'd finished about tea time and cooked me supper with Ian the gardener. That's it. And uh, you guys would get up and have your breakfast and then you go into the studio and work till about midnight. And then you go out clubbing. That's right. Amazing experience. And then come amazing. back and blow you up. And blow me up again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had all these... Um, <clears throat> bombs that we had from off, off the tour, you know, all these, uh, um, uh, uh, what are they called, uh, stage, stage bombs. Yeah. And we had all the, 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 the metal things that you put them in and all that. Anyway, we decided to put, set these things up around his tent one morning to, to frighten him. So they planted him in the ground and all the rest <laughs> of the rubbish. And it was right the side of Richard Branson's lake where he had all those um, prize fish. <laughs> So we put the, the bombs around, around there, and we waited till he got in there, and sure enough, bang! And the bloody tent just went, whoosh, like this, it just took off. <laughs> and he's, he's standing there in the tent, and the, it's gone. <laughs> but the worst of it was, all the concussion went through the lake, yeah. and all these prize fish, he killed some of them, and stunned some of them, Richard Branson's fish, fish. Like, oh no! I mean, it really backfired. Of course, he hit the roof, you know. I mean, he weren't at all pleased with that. <laughs> but, but it was just the first of many things that happened with Ian, and we had such a laugh. Bassist uh, Geezer Butler says that Born Again has uh, much the same feel as your, uh, your very first album. Well, it did to us, because it, it, it related a lot for us. Um, the feeling of when we'd done the first album, the, old, the feeling of the band was really... The vibes were great, really exciting. We were excited about doing it, and we'd done it a quick... Uh, in, in comparison to the, the last few albums we've done, which have taken a while. We've done this album pretty quick. I mean, the next album will probably show better because we'll have been with Ian and worked with him a bit, you know. So we just met Ian and we rehearsed and wrote the stuff and went and recorded it really fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly got a raw sound. So hopefully the next one now uh, we'll have, we'll have uh, worked with each other a while. We can improve from there now. Which is your uh, personal uh, favourite song on the new album? Um, I like Disturbing the Priest. The studio was at a church, and so you can imagine what happened. Suddenly looking through the control room, there's a priest there, a vicar. They got a petition together and brought it round and complaining about, about the noise we were making, you know. And he said, I wondered if we could come to some arrangement. We have choir practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we can't pitch properly because we're hearing your very lovely music. Of course, we'll shut the door and we won't play anything loud while you're having your choir practice. So then Ian wrote, wrote the lyrics to a song called Disturbing the Priest, you know. For which Black Sabbath got run out of town in Mexico some years later because the local clergy took it as absolute irrefutable evidence that they were in fact devil worshippers. Music's there to be enjoyed and we don't really want um, political or pseudo-religious zealots getting involved in Came back one night and Richard had a go-kart track in the grounds and uh, I was building a ramp. I was going to jump the lake on my motorcycle the next day. I, I was planning to, so I had my motorbike there and my helmet and all my kit and uh, the ramp wasn't quite right so I hadn't attempted it. And um, So I'd, we'd had a few drinks and uh, decided we we're going to... We bought a fleet of Ford Granadas instead of renting cars we thought we'd buy half a dozen for Granadas, one for everyone, and then the roadie was going to sell them at the end of the session. So they thought it would be cheaper. <laughs> Richard Branson had built 
a go-kart track which is big enough to race a car on but not big enough to overtake so we decided one night we were going to do time trials so i had my crash helmet and i decided i was going to go first pete resty tony's roadie was there ian the gardener a couple of the girls from the manor as is contained in the lyrics bill ward's new car just got delivered and uh, bill was having a nap so i decided to take him for a ride down to the local pub mr gillen had just purchased a nice rubber raft, an Avon rubber raft with a 25 horse Mercury on it to drive down the canal and meet me at the pub. The next move was to go back to the, to the manor. So Ian got in his boat, I got in the car, I drove a mile and a half back to the manor and I got there before he did. So I decided to pick him up at the outlet, which required driving across a golf course down onto the go-kart track and meeting him at the uh, boat launch in his raft. Well, he wasn't there yet, so I decided to start cutting some hot laps on the go-kart track with the car and developed quite a crowd. Everybody come outside to see what was going on and um, had a lot of people watching us as we were flying around the tractor. And when Ian pulled up, he said, that looks absolutely brilliant, mate. He goes, I want to try it. So I slid over to the left-hand side of the car, let him jump in the driver's seat. We're in England, remember, now it's a right-hand drive. And about a lap and a half into the, he made one lap around there on the second lap, he put it in the weeds and hit a big giant chunk of concrete and flipped the car over. So off he goes around this track. Instead of using his own car, he took Bill's car. And Bill's was actually the best car. He had the best car out of all of us. I did a load of laps and I was getting faster on each lap. And I must have clipped a tire um, on the previous lap. And as I was hanging out and coming into this bend, there was no way out. And the car just flipped. And I clipped it and the car went and I'm flying down the track, upside down, spinning round and round. I could feel my head against the track. It just lifted the car up and I rolled it like three or four times. And after flipping a couple of times, it was on its roof and it was spinning round and going along the track like that. He almost killed himself, actually. If he'd have gone a bit further, he'd have gone into the, the pond, which was in the middle. Are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. I was just getting out of this seatbelt, which is very difficult. Um, the window was open and somebody said, oh, thank God, you're all right. And reached for a cigarette and everyone <laughs> screamed, no, no, no. Because the fuel tank was ruptured and there was petrol everywhere. So had he lit a cigarette, that would have been fun too. Ruptured the gas tank. I watched gas run down Mr. Gillen's face to a lit cigarette hanging from his mouth upside down as he hung there from his seatbelt. And this gasoline went right out and put the cigarette out, poof, a little puff of smoke. So I kicked, I got back close enough to the car to save him and kicked the window out and Pulled Ian out. And I left a notice on there, uh, there's a chalkboard for messages because we didn't see much of each other. And I said to Paul, the tour manager, Paul Clark, I said, uh, oh, the, the, the car's down on the go-kart track and the keys are in it. You know, I didn't mention the fact it was upside down and trashed. And the next morning I went in and I heard this track that I'd never heard before, this sort of really raunchy sort of uh, up-tempo grinding rock thing. And that was it. I just wrote the words there and then and sang it that day. New record out from the band. It's called Born Again. Give everybody a look at the cover of Born Again. Look at this album sleeve. Look at this magnificent album sleeve. But this is an album sleeve that I didn't want to do. I was doing Aussie album sleeves, right? Ozzy Osbourne, Diary of a Madman. Apparently written by Mick Wall. I can't understand it. But you get all these pieces images stick them down oh i have to design them obviously but the, stick them down and then yeah. you put this piece of tracing paper right over the top right and write intricate instructions to the printer saying how much you love them and then what happens after this after this this is the magic the magic it turns out how like very, this. very nice. And how long would it take you to design a book cover like that as, as compared to something like the Live After Death album? This would Bionic. take me about five days. And this was a political stance by Don Arden to get people that were working for Sharon into his camp. So I was asked to design this sleeve and it's like, what's the worst idea? What's it called? Born Again. What's the worst idea? The old sleeve, I don't know what happened there myself, because that, uh, that was done, you know, uh, by the record company. I mean, we did see it, and it, it, as a matter of fact, when we first did it, we started laughing ourselves, we said, oh, they could never use that as an album cover. So, of course, we did.
Steve would later say he got the idea from a 1968 cover of the magazine Mind Alive, painting the image and attaching the horns, fangs, and fingernails, the same baby was used for the cover of Depeche Mode's single for New Life. Born Again, the 11th studio album from Black Sabbath would be released in September of 1983, the album cover is the subject of much debate, but it's nothing compared to the sound of the album. Overall the band expresses good thoughts about the music for the album, Bill Ward holds his work on the album up in high regard, saying some of his fills and grooves are the best he has ever done and speaks highly of Ian Gillen. Born Again, released in September 1983, was an incredibly heavy album, but the combination of Gillen's lyrics and vocals sat uncomfortably alongside Iommi's dark and ominous riffs. Born Again has to be the worst album Black Sabbath ever did. Born Again is known as Sabbath's Marmite album. You either love it or hate it. And the songs I think were quite good. Born Again, Zero the Hero, Disturbing the Priest, uh, Digital Bitch, Trashed, you know, a lot of good stuff on there. I love the album. It's, I think it's fantastic. Um, what I didn't like was the way it changed from what I was hearing on the monitors. Before we knew it, it was number four in the British charts, and we heard a copy of it, and it, the sound was all dreadful, you know. <laughs> Fingers crossed for a remix one day. I think it would do well if it was. When it comes to the muffled sound, there are varying opinions. Iommi has said that Gillen was playing the backing tracks so loudly that he inadvertently blew a couple of tweeters in the studio speakers and nobody noticed. I, I took home some monitor mixes on a cassette in those days, which I still have, and it still sounds amazing. And then I heard the mix and the production for the first time. And all I could hear was right there. There's a somebody throwing a blanket. A blanket over the whole thing. And he'll deny it, but Giza went to London to supervise a remix. Uh -huh. And that's what we ended up with. And uh, I think he might have had a slight bent towards the bottom end of the sound, you know, being the bass player. When he received a copy of the album, it sounded so awful that he threw the tape out of his car window, and it wouldn't be the only time a tape of the album would reach that fate. I'll be honest with you, we were touring Europe in um, 83, and we got a cassette of the album, and we heard this song called Zero the Hero, and the driver's side window went down, the eject button got hit, and the tape went out the window and went, what is this shit? Geezer Butler has said that he heard a horrible mix in the studio, but was told that it would be corrected during the final mixing and mastering phase. Whatever the reason the band were already on tour and didn't have the time to hear a test pressing. Terrible record. Disturbing the Priest and Zero the Hero are okay, quite decent. The rest of it is a mess. It sounds like Ian Gillen and Black Sabbath not getting on. They didn't quite know what they wanted to do. His voice is way too subtle to go with the bludgeoning kind of chunky metal stuff that Sabbath do. It doesn't make sense. Never, it's weird, might as well have had Kyle Minogue join. While the quality of the album is up for debate, the success of it isn't, reaching number four on the UK charts, their highest position since Sabbath Bloody Sabbath in 1973, also becoming a top 40 on the US charts. Born Again Unmixed Demos and The Fallen was released by a Japanese bootleg company on August the 15th of 2004, reportedly a tape was in the hands of an ex-girlfriend of Bill Ward's, containing the unreleased track The Fallen, and the in-progress monitor mix that Ian spoke highly of, giving all the fans the chance to hear how the album was supposed to sound like. The tape has different guitar solos and extended pieces of music. Because we got on tour and Bill couldn't do the tour, Bill Ward, it was on the album. Right. Right again. He couldn't do it, because uh, he started having a lot of problems. It's totally there, totally sober. And... Um, and then I drank again, because there was going to be a tour uh, to follow that up. And uh, I tried to get along with the idea of Ozzy not being there. Let's try this with Ian. And I started becoming in a lot of fear. And I was unable to share the fears. Instead, I drank behind them. 
it was his six months that he's been stopped drinking, so I went out and bought him a plaque, you know, Bill Ward, uh, six months and stopped drinking, congratulations and so on. I got back to the bloody house with it and he was drunk. And I couldn't believe it, I went, oh no. We didn't take him on a tour properly because we didn't want to get him back into drinking again. Because his old thing, he has to stick to his programme mm. of non-drinking and, you know, go to regular AA meetings and stuff like that. Right. And we found when we brought him to England, when we'd done the Born Again album, he couldn't find proper facilities for his, um, you know, to, for his counselling and stuff. He mm. couldn't, couldn't find proper people here, like he can in America. I mean, people take care of you a lot because there's a lot of alcoholism there. I mean, there's no way he would have handled it, say, for instance, this last tour we've just done of Europe, because uh, you, you can't very well go to reception parties and stuff, and everybody's drinking, and you're, you're a recovering alcoholic, and everybody's drinking around you, and you're standing there going, oh, <laughs> what do I do? You know, it's very hard, I mean, it, it was very hard for him. I became so ill again that I was, uh, that I was ready to go into a hospital and um, get you know, try and get well. And that was, uh, I went back into the hospital in uh, January the 2nd, I believe it was, or the 3rd, 1984. And I haven't had a drink or a drug since. Part of the, the Born Again concept is that you now have Bev Bevan in the band, a mm -hmm. VLO fan. Bev stood in really quick, actually, when Bill had to leave mm -hmm. due to illness again. Yeah. And um, Bev's been doing the tour with us, and it, it'll be... I think a member of the band now, will they? <laughs> well, his, his loan is from the ELO is becoming yeah, more and more permanent, and I think uh, we'd all like him to stay. Uh, you guys are buddies, aren't you? Yeah. From well, the, I can't stand Bev personally. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> well, at least on stage. You're <laughs> no, he's, he's great. He's great. Uh -huh. Fits in great. And he's also going potty now because he's got a chance to really play loud, you know. I think over the last few years he's been fairly constrained in what he's been able to do. Yeah. yeah. And like, all drummers like going berserk, you know, so he's loving it. You came from an entirely different kind of music. You had been with ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra. Mm -hmm. You were playing kind of a soft rock. Now you're into the big, heavy metal. Yeah. That was a, a big change for you. I guess it was, but that, I started off playing real heavy rock and roll music. That's the sort of drumming I like to do. I started way off many, many years ago, around before Jesus Christ here was uh, was born. <laughs> uh, playing in a band called playing in a band called The Move. Uh, and we were we did a lot of heavy stuff in those days. And then uh, ELO sort of mellowed out rather. And I got I got a little bit lazy. Yeah. But now I'm uh, there's no chance of that now with these guys. I have to work hard every night. Well, I, I just joined. I'm the lyricist member, and I don't find any one of them evil at all. The friendliest guys in the world. Bev, uh, a lot of people w w said ELO, but they tend to forget that uh, he was part of the move, one of the original heavy bands. I mean, people would think of Bev as being, well, ELO, it's a total change to Sabbath. But in actual fact, Bev's a very, very, very powerful drummer, extremely powerful. And he's very underestimated in, the, in this business, uh, as far as the drummer-wise. I mean, he's known as a celebrity or whatever. But... But the drummer itself is, is very, very good. He's very powerful, very strong. And um, just playing with the band for just a short while is improving so much. And he's, I mean, first of all, when he first came with us, he says, well, as long as I don't have to do any drum solos, he says, because I don't like drum solos. And we says, okay, fine. The next thing we know, he's doing drum solos, we can't stop him. <laughs> I mean, this is many years later, and you're still, um, your, your new uh, album has a, a picture of what looks like the baby Lucifer. It's called Born Again, you know, with the long claws and the great looking kid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, you're still at it. Why? Um, is it good at it? This new lineup would rehearse between the 7th and 14th of August, 1983 at the National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham, England, with the first concert set for the 18th of August, and of course no Black Sabbath tour can run without some heavy kinks in the wheel. I remember the day in Birmingham when uh, the LSD, Light and Sound uh, Productions, the guy said, anyone got any idea for a stage set? And Geezer Butler said, here's Stonehenge. And I said, great idea. He said, how do you visualize it? And he said, well, life size, of course. <laughs> So they produced a life-size Stonehenge. When this thing first showed up, we go, bloody hell, is this it, you know? 
Where are we going to put this? Well, this is the miniature set. The, the, um, With the, the little reason. miniature dolls? No, that's, oh. that's the miniature <laughs> <laughs> Stonehenge, awesome. because what happened was that, in fact, the original Stonehenge that we built was bigger than the Stonehenge in, oh. in Salisbury Plain. They made a life-size, it wasn't actually, it was about two-thirds scale, but it was still big enough. It was still too big. For it made out of years. carbon fibre or fibreglass, and uh, anyway. And it was great, but uh, when we found uh, how actually big it was, we set it all up on the first night and no one could see us. And we, we could get about a quarter of it on stage, and we're sort of edging between these huge monoliths and whatever. The life-size Stonehenge was just the first in a series of Spinal Tap-esque surprises that the manager, Don Arden, had in store for the band. The next one was a little smaller, though. He said, I just want to introduce you to this chap. And we walked in the room, and there's this little chap with a red rubber suit on with eyes and, and bloody hell. We noticed a dwarf walking around on the day before the opening show. And what's this dwarf? Oh, never mind, never mind. And it was the baby off the, the Born Again album. So they had this dwarf dressed up as a baby, the devil's baby, crawling across us, who appeared on top of the Stonehenge, miming to the sound of a, a baby's scream that was flanged, or phased, as it used to be called. He'd get up on, and run across the, the small columns, which weren't small, they were probably 15 foot high. We stood there in wonderment as this twisted dwarf managed to rise up in the middle and fall away to this echo echoing baby scream onto a pile of mattresses and then jump into the front of the stage and go like this and his eyes would light up and the roadies come out dressed as druids which is very effective apart from the rebox you can see under their um, gowns under their robes which to a tolling bell and they would then somberly walk across the stage in procession to the sound of a, a low bell tolling at which point we're supposed to go on and open the show and we're saying to Don we think this is in the worst possible taste, this dwarf, you know. And Don's going, no, the kids will love it, the kids will love it, you know, it'll be great. And of course you can imagine how that went down with the crew, because they absolutely hated him. Because he was a star, you know, he was one, off, one of the chaps off Star Wars and he kept like, you know. So they hated it, so they'd done everything, they'd put him in boxes and hung him in the, on the stage. And... So we started off the show and the baby in full costume now, so we're watching from the wings, and this dwarf comes out in a red costume with the yellow fingernails, wah, screaming, I'm looking at the kids, they're going... <laughs> really, I mean, just everyone was bursting into laughter, you know, it was absolutely horrendous. So anyway, the dwarf came out and fell off, and the scream sort of tailed away, and the monks came out with their cows, dong, the bells, happened. and you could still hear the screaming in the background. It wasn't the tape, it was the dwarf, because we'd taken all the mattresses away, you see. But the screaming hadn't stopped, and it had taken on a lifelike texture because somebody had removed the mattress. Yep. <laughs> um, somebody in the band. And, um... <laughs> and that was the end of the dwarf. We were in stitches. I mean, we, it was so hard to try and go on and do the show after this. That's right, yeah. Well, we started the, uh, the tour, and um, we we're having quite a bit of difficulty with doing some of the old stuff with Ian. I have one more question for you, Ian, because the last mm. we had heard, we knew about the, the solo thing that you were doing in the band that you had together, and then we heard that a doctor said, don't sing for a year, or you will permanently ruin your voice. Mm -hmm. What's happened that now you can well, that's sing a, Black Sabbath? That's material. a bit distorted, actually. Once or twice before, I've had to uh, take a break. I think every singer gets problems with nodes. All it is is like blisters on your tonsils, you know, blisters on your vocal cords. And it, when, the problem is, when you get blisters on your blisters, then you've got to take a rest, you know. And all it, it's just a simple rescue, and it wasn't a year, it was six months. At six months was plenty, three to six months. So you're not going to bow out of this tour in the middle or anything? No, no, it's going fine. I've, I haven't got blisters on my blisters at the moment, so okay. everything's fine. In fact, uh, before we'd done the, the tour, he, he was told to stop singing for a while while he had some operation on his throat, which he should have done. And uh, we arranged him to go into the hospital and have a, the nodes removed from his throat, and he didn't go. So anyway, they seemed to get on all right while we'd done the recording. And then we went on to the tour and uh, they started going again. He said, having trouble with his throat. I had had great difficulty absorbing certain of Ozzy's lyrics. I couldn't understand them. And uh, so the day before we went away, I said to my wife, I said, I, I cannot soak in these words. There's no storyline, there's no... 
I can't relate to what they mean. And I'm sorry, but Iron Man just wouldn't sink in. <laughs> and uh, um, the, I, I couldn't grasp it. I just, right. I, my head was just not tuned to this. Much different singing style to what you're it's not the, to. Yes, it wasn't the notes or the style. It was the, the actual words. I just thought, oh, I don't want to sing this. So I had this book, a display book with plastic pages, and I, I wrote cues. I wrote the lyrics, actually. And I had them put two wedges on the front of the stage. They weren't plugged in, but two monitor wedges to conceal the book. I practiced turning the pages with my feet in my kitchen at home before I went away. And it worked very well. Unbeknownst to Gillen, is at the beginning of the show, they're going to pump dry ice out onto the stage, which comes up to about there. Thick, dry ice. Which to a tolling bell, and then the dry ice, which they also didn't do at rehearsal. And I walk out, bearing in mind that Ronnie Deer was the previous singer. And it's great. The audience is fantastic, but going zerk and whatever. And I walk out, and they've got the biggest amount of dry ice I've ever seen. They must have had six buckets up there. And the dry ice is pumping out, and there's floor spots and everything else. And I suddenly, I'm going around giving it all that, you know, shaking the mic stand around and, yeah. And uh, I suddenly went, oh, shit. I suddenly realised it's my turn to actually go on and sing, and I cannot remember the first line of the first song. It's all too much for me. And I wasn't prepared for this shoulder-high wall of dry ice that came out at a speed faster than I was walking. And so I did a little skip and it overtook me still. And I realise now that I'm standing shoulder-high in dry ice, staring at an audience. And he had his hair down like this, he's going like this, and he goes, shh, try, trying to see the lyrics. <laughs> and so I had to fall to my knees, you know, in a sort of in a dramatic pose, you know, and I'm going, <laughs> trying to blow the dry ice away. I was, I was very close there, I was looking at that. And you suddenly get Gillen coming out. And the song starts, he obviously knows the first line, and he's got it and he's... But at that point, the floor lights came on and blind me. <laughs> in this built into the stage. So eventually I managed to get the first line, and I stand up a moment <laughs> and sing the first line, but I don't know the second song, I'm going down again. And I, I heard somebody in the front shout out, It's Ronnie Dio! <laughs> <laughs> Quite right, and come on, feel the noise. Now they supported, I think, Black Sabbath last year, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, October, November, and now going on to December. Oh, they they were doing great then. It was uh, pretty well, not embarrassing. It was good fun having the, the band that's opening for you getting their album to number one. I remember taking a case of champagne, champagne into the dressing room. We were, I think, number forty-five at the time in the American show. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the videos, Tony. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about. Don't ask me. <laughs> Go on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'll go. laughs> We're halfway through it at the moment. With which it, tunes are you going to do? We're doing Trashed and Zero the Hero. So um, you're doing two then? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, we don't know exactly which is going to be used first or exactly how they're going to turn out. It's a conceptual thing, which is going to be a combination of some shots taken from some concerts we've done in Canada, and. Um, that's going to be overlaid and mixed in with the rest of the story, which has not quite been finalised. They're doing that in London at the moment. Who's directing the video? Lindsay, what's his name? You know, the other... Oh, sure. <laughs> the other fella. Video director Lindsay Clennell would film the band's soundcheck in concert on December the 21st of 1983 at the Montreal Forum, later filming the conceptual segments in London. Clennell has made it known that the concert was filmed in its entirety, so Warner Brothers has a full concert from this era in their possession. The tour tested the loyalties of Sabbath fans, and the inclusion of Deep Purple's Smoke on the Water was a bit too much for most Sabbath fans to take.
sellout tour went on for the rest of the year, but many fans, both of Sabbath and Purple, gave Ian a hard time. It's very difficult to have to front up another major band, you know, and sing their songs. Uh, and I thought he'd done really well. I think we got on great uh, uh, as people, you know. But um, I don't think it gelled properly like it should have done with uh, the combination as we set up. Well, we found out Ian was already arranging to get the Purple back together anyway. Oh, so he is, um, he is now, of course, now in Deep Purple with Richard Black. That's right. They've really formed. And we'll have to do Born Again disaster was over with. I just got totally disillusioned with the whole thing and I left in, what was it, 80... Uh, sometime in 1984 after the Born Again tour, I just had enough of it. People got involved that still stirred it up a little bit and uh, anyway, Geezer went off and, and done his own thing. And I done mine. Thank you.